We're in Parashat Vayakel, Shavua Tov, and we can find it on Shmot, chapter 35, verse 1. Okay. Moshe et kol adad bnei Yisrael, and Moses gathered. The name is Vayakel. Vayakel means to gather. However, the shorish of the word Vayakel is kahal, kehila, a community. Now, we have in the Rashi uh, traditional uh, commentary, there is almost no uh, commentary. Why? Because the text of Parashat Vayakel is almost similar, identical to the text of Parashat Truma. And Parashat Pekudei is almost the same as Parashat Tetzaveh. So why is it that we have to repeat the same thing all over again? However, in the uh, Zohar of this parasha, you have uh, 164 pages. And in the Pekudei, you have a whole book, a whole volume. Just for par like 300 pages, that's for Parashat Pekudei. So what are we adding over here that we don't see? Because the text is similar. And now, so in order to understand that, let's understand the text. The context. The context was that whoever listened to the previous weeks, Exodus in Shemot, Mount Sinai Revelation, Parashat Itro, then Parashat Mishpatim is extending of understanding of the law of the universe, and whoever understands that simply gets by, or gets through, or get to do what he wants to do in their less uh, trials and tribulations, you know, knowing the rules makes it much easier. Okay, and if you don't know the rules, you're not exempt of the punishment, right? Let's say you don't know anything about gravity. So you fall from a mountain, you'll fall exactly the same way as someone who knows, right? Because not knowing the rules does not give you, makes you exempt of the punishment, right? So we have to know the rules, that's Parashat Mishpatim. Then we had, after that, we had the Parashat of Tuma and Tetzaveh that were about, you know the rules, build something, build your life, build the tabernacle, build your life as a temple, and your life will be holy. And what do you need more than that? Parashat Tetzaveh was the completion two weeks ago. What was the completion? Tetzaveh means a new shell order. You take responsibility and you can order the holiness, holiness with the WH, completion in whatever you do. Isn't that what we're here for? That whatever you do, you can bring into it all the light, the holiness, the completion and fulfillment that is possible, that is available. This is the, the peak. But last week we read Kitisa. And Kitisa was about Moses coming down from the mount with the tablets. Which means that Parashat uh, Mishpatim, Turma, and Tetzaveh were given on Mount Sinai. Moses is coming down from the mount and there is a golden calf. Everything turns around. Why? Mishpatim, Turma, Tetzaveh were on Mount Sinai. They were given in the context of the people, the Israelites standing on Mount Sinai and receiving the law, which means realizing, assuming position, we are the children of God and this world is our playing ground to really, to order the light into the vessel. Okay? But there was a gone calf. And the gone calf broke that completion. Everything right now is back to chaos. Back to the chaos before the Exodus. It's not exactly back to the chaos. A lot of negativity was broken. The experience the Israelite had on Mount Sinai and getting out of Egypt will never be forgotten. It moved the whole of humanity huge step forward. But I have, now, now that the golden calf happened, everything is different. Back to chaos, which means the rules of putting everything together are different. You have a lot of friction that was not calculated on Parashat Mishpatim to Remind Tetzaveh. 
Now, Moses has to go back to the mount and to bring another set of tablets. Why? Because the previous set was meant for a universe without the golden calf, a universe that already reached a place of what is called the messianic age. The age of no death. The age that chaos has no power as it had before the Exodus. Now we went, you know, few steps forward and few steps back. We went more steps forward than back. But now we have to re recalculate our direction. We recalculate the rules. And therefore, says Rashi, the great uh, commentator, he lived in France in the 11th century, and he is the most uh, famous. And you can't have uh, like uh, a, a Bible book in Hebrew printed with a commentary without his commentary in there for the last thousand years. You know, that's an accomplishment to be a bestseller for a thousand years. Right? I, I don't think a lot of people reach that level. So says Rashi, Vayakel Moshe, and Moses gathered Lemacharat Yom Kippurim. It was exactly the day after Yom Kippur. Why Yom Kippur? Exodus, Pesach, Passover, right? Six days later, the splitting of the Red Sea. Six more weeks, Mount Sinai revelation. Forty days later, golden calf. Moses comes down with the tablets, breaks them down, asking and praying for forgiveness. He's getting, you know, okay, we fell big time. We'll get up, start all over again. He goes again to the mountain. On Rosh Chodesh Elul, the new moon of Virgo. He goes for another period of 40 days. He comes back when? Yom Kippur. With a second set of tablets and with the message of forgiveness. Since then, we celebrate the message of forgiveness on Yom Kippur. But every Yom Kippur has the day after Yom Kippur. And the day after Yom Kippur, Moses is redirecting the world towards the new era. This is an era, you know, the same way you you choose a way you have some in ways you can choose a longer way shorter way cheaper way more expensive way correct it like gives you the options okay before we chose the cheaper and the easiest way didn't work so by choosing the golden calf that was a longer more expensive way now Moses has to give us the rules for this way the way that says direct flight for free to heavens to a world full of heaven everywhere that was taken on mount sinai and by the golden calf we gave up that route correct we simply you know sometimes you get tired from the highway and the first exit you take oh my god where where am i i'm no man's land where where, where am i Okay, but now you have to redirect your course, right? Your direction. This is Parashat Vayakel. So if Parashat Teruma and Tetzaveh was about finding your calling and each one of us finding his calling, how do I become the messenger of the light in this world? The way I build my life, the way I build myself, which means the temple and the priest. Now, the rules are different. Why? Something happened in that rule, in that world, that changed the rules. And how did it change the rules? I think somehow this is the difference between the uh, in our world today, with in the in the Western world, between the left and the right. Okay, and we'll see why. Okay. We're going now to the Zohar that explains that verse 7, Parashat uh, Vayakel. It says like this. Bore, Makti Bekadmeta. What does it say before? In Parashat Tuma, it's, a, it's almost the same to the word 
as in Parashat Truma. What does it say in Parashat Truma? Me'et kol ish asher idvenu libo. You take the donations, the gifts, for the tabernacle from every person that his or her heart will give. Okay? Will be generous. Le'achlela kola. What does it mean? Soon, begin the va'a kutsha b'chul emeva dovada de mashkena mikol sitrin. Be'mocha u'klifa. Ubegin the havo inu nerevra begavayu. Itmar me'et kol ish o sherit ven olibo. Le'achlela lon be'inayu di Israel di inun mocha v'chulu it pekadu. Translation. What does it say? In the beginning, Parashat Tuma, it says from every person, everyone who wants is invited to join the building of the tabernacle. We're saying, we said when we read Parashat Tuma a few weeks ago, that we will never build the tabernacle again. Why? When time is come, when time is, is come we build Beit HaMikdash, the temple. The tabernacle was a portable temple the Israelites carried in the desert for the 40 years. The 40s were over a long time ago. Why are we still reading it? Because each one of us has a portable temple. It's where you live. And you know, people today move from one place to another. And they have to know how to move their portable temple from one apartment or house to another, from one country and city to another, according to their tikkun. Also, your temple is also your place of work. Some people, they work in, a, in the farm. Some people, they work in an office. Some people, they work on an airplane and in a train. They work, like today, you have the smartphone and that's your work. That's your business. And you connect to the whole world. Wherever you are, you carry with you your little temple. And you are the high priest. And your job, your calling is, how do I bring light to the world in whatever I do? Well, you know, I, you know, I have to get uh, to get some sustenance. I have to get some uh, to make a living. What has that to do? When I make the money, I can do some charity work. No, everything you do, if you remember, everything was chaos. Why was it chaos? We were created as perfect creatures, and because we were perfect, we couldn't accept perfection as a gift. We wanted to make it perfection, to make it perfect, to perfect it, okay? What does it mean? Most people, how do they make a living? You put together things for people that they can't put it together themselves, and they pay you for that. That's how you make a living, right? In return, they help you put together stuff that you can put together, okay? That's called modern economy. Everybody takes care of what they're supposed to take care of. Okay? Putting things together for the others so it feels like a whole. However, there is a problem in this idealistic picture. What historians called a few decades ago the end of history. What's the end of history? Everything will stay the way it is. Why? From now on, you know, people lost already the idea of conquering a country, changing the land, changing the people, ethnic cleansing is not acceptable anymore. The way it is, the way it will stay. The only difference is people are reinventing themselves. They're learning, becoming more sophisticated, more bright, more smart, sharing with each other the whole world that's the way it's going to get till everything will be a perfect universe. And everybody was going that direction. The problem is, it's not everybody. <laughs> There's a little golden calf in the middle. And what it is, it says in the, so I'm reading again what I just, you know, translating again what I just read. In the beginning, everybody was included. Before the golden calf, Mount Sinai Revelation, everybody accepted whatever we do, we do it truthfully. There's no inside and outside, which means no ulterior motives. 
everything on the table. Honesty, honesty, honesty. Because we all want to do the good. That was Mount Sinai revelation. Therefore, the first set of tablets, it said, was miraculously made. You could read the same for both sides. So what? You know, it's exciting for a minute or two. But then what? The answer is, it was meant for humanity that whatever you say, that's what you meant. Whatever you mean, that's what you say. And because you mean well, you'll never hurt anyone because you know the rules. You simply know the rules. And you'll never be crazy to cheat someone, to hurt someone, because you know you're going to be hurt first. That was the code of Mishpatim to Umayin Tetzaveh. But something came in between. So before that, everybody was included. Why everybody was included? The Creator wanted that Mishkan will be built from all directions, external and internal. Why? When you make something, when you build a company or a society, it is complete when you have everyone participating in the same goal, although each one is doing a certain a different job. Correct? So, let's say some people in a company, they sit and plan. Why? Because somehow it looks like they are good in planning. Other people, they are very much, very much better in doing. So, they read the plans and they start to manufacture. They can't sit and plan they don't have the patience for that they want to do something with their hands okay so they get to do with the hands and other people they love to serve they don't like to sit and you know do the same thing and they oh yeah they like to come and you know they you know they like to uh to make sure that everything is clean and that everybody has the supplies that they need you have to fit a person to his job why because if a person is doing the wrong job everybody suffers right mm -hmm. okay but there that's why we are so different from each other so there are people who belong to the external and that people belong to the internal why that's the way the world was created however then how do we see that in the exodus there were two groups of people that came out of egypt says the zohar and rabbi azakluria explained it even more when we are talking about the people that came out of Egypt, it's not the first time we meet them making noise on the stage of history. The first time we meet, we meet them as a collective, that was the story of the flood. You heard about Atlantis? Mm. There was a very, very advanced society in technology, in wisdom and so on. However, they mess it up. They mess it up big time till the whole, the whole environment collapsed. That was a flood. They drowned. Did they disappear? Nobody disappears. They resurfaced the same souls. They were very eccentric, very creative, very full of desires. And, you know, when somebody has a lot of desires and he has no values or moral or morality that will come out as you know let's get it all and whatever price who cares just because i want it was a very young part of humanity and they didn't know the rules that well they thought they knew the rules everything collapsed what was the result the world collapsed everybody died except from noah and those souls came back. Second stage. Second scene. Now it's called the Tower of Babel. These souls are coming back. They want again advanced technology. They want to build something that will be so powerful. The flood will never happen again. They build the Tower of Babel. Doesn't work because they came from the wrong place. They still wanted to cheat the universe. You cannot cheat the universe. As we said last week, Parashat Kitisa, you want to get 10, you want to get it 10, 
you have to commit to give it 10, right? Mm -hmm. Marriage, economy, sustenance, health, everywhere. You cannot give two and get that. It doesn't work. Maybe for a short while, it looks like. Yeah, yeah, we did it. The universe didn't realize. Poof. You know, you can't cheat the system. Can't cheat the system. They were so young, they thought they can cheat the system. That col collapsed. The end of the Tower of Babel, the person who recollected recoll all of that experience and got the lesson was Abraham. He got it. There is a system. And he can't cheat. He can't fool the system. He's the first one who got it. And he started a journey of cleansing and cleansing and cleansing, realizing the fact that I want it is not enough. Isaac made it even more sophisticated. Jacob made it even more sophisticated. And all three made such a leap of cleansing. So their descendants come to Egypt. They go to the Egyptian hell. The ones who did not drown enough to pay for what they did. In Atlantis story, says Rabbi Isaac Lord, they had to drown again. And that's why Pharaoh drowned the boys. All the boys should be drowned in the Nile. And they were drowned again and again for 210 years of terrible misery. They were simply polished and polished again and again refined. And that's why the Torah calls Egypt the iron furnace. Why? When you get, says Rabbi Azakluria, the, the, the ores of gold from the mountain, they don't look like gold. You put them in an iron furnace and you blow till it's so hot. The dirt burns out and the clean liquid metal accumulates in the corner. It's not yet clean. You have to make another cycle and another cycle, and another cycle till finally you have it refined. That's what happened to the Israelites in the 10, 210 years of Egypt. When they're coming out of Egypt, they're refined. But if you think about it, says Rabbi Zakloya, the whole story of the Ten Plagues was a huge wizardry duel between Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh and his wizards. Who won? Moses. Now, a little inside information. The wizards of Pharaoh were also for the same kind of souls. Atlantis, the Tower of Babel, but they did not have the refinement of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They did not have the refinement of the iron furnace in Egypt. They had it easy. So their were souls were still loaded with a lot of selfishness, says Rav Ashlag. However, they asked Moses to come with them, with him. Why? He won. He had the power. They couldn't wait to see what's the next stage. Egypt was already like losers. It's like that was the past already. They wanted to join the winner. And the winner is Moses. And the loser is Pharaoh. Where's Pharaoh? In the museum. Where's Moses? Everywhere you hear about the Mosaic Law 34 centuries later. How many people you know that they follow Pharaoh's ideas, Pharaoh's trail? Very few. How many people claim they follow Moses' rules? Every lawmaker, many lawmakers around the world in every country, yes, we have to bring the justice, we have to bring the, uh, all the stuff, you know. Do not kill, do not... Moses brought it from the mount. Okay? And as 
a cosmic idea that cannot be cannot be uh, compromised. That was Moses. Pharaoh could kill anyone he wanted. The law was not for Pharaoh. The law was for the commoners. Moses brought a law that is for everyone. And you know what? Maybe they don't do it in many countries, but there's still a dream about it. Who won? Moses. So those wizards of Egypt, they wanted to follow Moses. Moses is asking God, God, what should I do? And God says, you know, in a way they are right. You, as a reincarnation of Noah, you're responsible for them too. However, I advise you, says the Zohar, God says to Moses, leave them over here in Egypt. Take the Israelites. They already went through the refinement. They're easier to handle. They can understand what does it mean, love others as you love yourself, says Rav Ashlag. Only people who suffered so much can understand what does it mean getting out of yourself. But these guys, they're so fat from the pleasures of Egypt. Their bodies are so heavy from just, you know, sitting on the, all the richness of Egypt. You tell them about loving others as you love yourself, they don't get the idea. So you take the Israelites, says the Zohar. God says to Moses, take the Israelites, get them to Mount Sinai, reach with them till they are so close to me and to each other. And when they're crystallized as a society and they're ready, you have to go back to Egypt and pick up those wizards. And there's another way. You can take them out with the Israelites and hope for the good. I wish you don't do that. Too risky. Now you have to remember one thing about Moses. Moses was a Pisces. Pisces, one of the problems of Pisces, they can be gamblers. And Moses is gambling. He's taking those wizards who are called Erev Rav, says the Zohar. Why Erev Rav? The magic they used was called Erev Rav. This was the school of magic they were using. He takes them with him and he says, we will be so powerful, we'll do all at once. Six hours before Moses coming down from the mount, the Erev Rav come to, Mo to Aaron and say, make us a god. <laughs> Because we don't know what happened to that guy. What's his name? Moses. That's the way it's written. He took you out of Egypt. He did you a favor. He didn't have to take you. So you know what? You want to be... So there I said, do you want us to be together? Or you want us each one to go on a separate way? So Aaron made them a golden calf so they go on their separate way. Because they were so unrefined. Says the Zohar. In the beginning, the Mishkan, the Tabernacle, everything, the whole creation of the universe was supposed to include everyone. The Israelites, the Erev Rav, all the nations, everyone included. In the moment of the golden calf, what happens? Each one went after its kind, which is the Erev Rav made the golden calf. So why it says the Israelites did the, Erev, the, the golden calf? Look, let's go back again to modern history. What do historians say about modern history? When atrocities happen, usually it starts with a vicious minority. Whose fault is it? The vicious minority or the silent majority who did nothing to stop it. Right? The Israelites saw how the Erev Rav harassed Aaron and nobody came to his help. Almost no one. Whose responsibility is that? 
When we say that, you know, if you learn about the history of World War II, the, the Nazis were a minority in Germany in 1933. However, in 1939, they were already the majority. How come? Nobody opposed them. Nobody had the guts to fight against it. When Germany fell, everybody suffered. The Nazis and the non-Nazis. Germany shrunk. Huge part of Germany was cut off. 12 million ethnic Germans were simply ethnically cleansed from Poland, from Ukraine, from other countries, from Czechoslovakia, whatever, from France, and simply thrown into the new Germany. Homeless, refugees, nobody had pity for them whatsoever. Yeah, but well, maybe there were no Nazis. They're not all of them. Nobody asked. Why? Taking responsibility means that when you see atrocities, you don't stand on the side. That's not me. Because the moment you witness it, you take responsibility. And that's why when a little minority in any society is going for the atrocities, it could be in a company, and the others know and they do nothing, you have the karmatic debt and you'll pay for it. The Israelites are blamed for the golden calf because they were the majority. They could stop it. They didn't stop it. So that's your fault. And you're still paying the, paying the consequences. Okay? So, although the Erev have caused death and killing for everyone, for the whole nation, just, not just for the Erev of themselves, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God said, the moment you guys chose, you already chose. You chose the way. You chose to follow the golden calf. You cannot take part in building the tabernacle. From that moment on, we know that when anyone is building himself any kind of a community, a community could be a synagogue, a community could be a neighborhood, a community could be a, a large family, a community is a nation, a party, a place of work, a company. All of these are communities, right? Because it's dependent on the participation, the support, and the coordination of a lot of people into one big project. From that moment on, the same way as Moses had to go to the mountain to bring different two tablets, that you can't read the same from both sides. Which means you know that what people say is not always what they mean. Either because they're very nice and they don't want to hurt you. Why is it that they don't want to hurt you? Because if you're really, really nice and really sensitive, you know that most people cannot hear the truth. So you don't know what the truth is, you do what's right. You do what will, be, will we bring results. Which means, let's say as a teacher, or as a boss, or as a colleague, you know that most people are not the same in the outside and the outside. And if you want them to function with you, there is as much you can tell them about what you think about them. Because they, most of the times they're going to get hurt. So you do suspect them for being not developed enough because a very spiritual person, when you come to him and say, I have some issues with you, can I say it in front of you? Can I put everything on the table? A very spiritual person is a kind of a person that he is willing to hear. He will be glad thank you for telling me because I really needed to know because how would I improve myself because we all have blind spots how do you get to see the blind spots to somebody else's eyes so a true spiritual person won't be insulted 
he will be thankful for someone else sharing with him what I cannot see. How many people do you know can do that? Most people shut down. The moment you start to expose their shortcomings, they shut down and they start to hate you. So, if you're wise and you are merciful and you're loving, you will never tell all the truth and nothing but the truth to the person you love. Why? You know they can't stand it. They think that they can't bury it. It's like they, most people cannot. Only people really, really committed for the truth. So, however, we know right now that we have the world divided into two sections. There are people they are committed to the truth. Maybe not 100%. But they still, they will never hurt others deliberately. Why? They have some values that are based on the mosaic wisdom, if we're talking about the West. But look, most of societies in the East and in the South are also derived somehow trying or being based on the Mosaic Law. And you find a lot of people that did go through a long journey and you find a lot of societies and how do you know these societies? Usually the research shows these societies are much richer than other societies. Why? Because when society is rich which means there's accumulated wealth. It's conditioned by the honesty of the individuals belonging to that society. And yet that's why you see countries like Japan or like Switzerland or Finland, that they don't have natural resources, but they're still very rich because they have this mutual trust and when you have this mutual, mutual trust that most people around you they try to be honest and they will do their best to bring results about whatever they do that brings productivity and richness and there is blessing in their hands whatever they do on the other hand you look at countries that are very old very rich like by resources and they're very poor. Where's the money? Stolen. Stolen. Or simply lost because of lack of efficiency. When you see countries, there's so much, there's so much uh, uh, regulation. Or companies. It's because, why do you have so much regulation? It's so much, why? Because people don't trust each other. So the energy you spend on regulation and watching everybody and policing everyone, that energy shows about what? Loss of profits, loss of productivity. Because you have a huge amount of people that instead of producing money and goods, they are busy watching other people not to cheat. And you know what, says Rav Ashlag? Watching other people not to cheat is a very hard work. <laughs> Who is going to watch the ones who are watching, says Rav Ashlag. Huh? You need to have a police that will watch the police. And that will become a police state. So every country that is built on lack of trust, look at the Soviet Union. There was a police over a police trying to force everybody to work. Didn't work. Why? People did not. They knew. They work hard, they'll get, they will never get as much as they work. Why should I work so hard? And you can't police everyone. So it became, it will become, says Ravash, like every country like this, a police state. And finally, that society has to collapse because they won't have what to eat. Look at the Soviet Union. Look at Venezuela. Look at North Korea. All of these places that are not built on mutual trust, they have to collapse. Now what happens is that you have to realize 
that you can't trust everyone that their motives are pure. You have to check. Because some people whose motives are pure, they can produce more. And you have to, to do what is not allowed in the PC culture, profiling. You have to check what are the motives of the person. Because what the Zohar says, some people belong to the core and some people belong to the outskirts. Who belongs to the core? The people who, has, who have that acceptance, acceptance of the values of do not kill and do not steal for whatever it means. These people can manufacture and create and generate much more. The others can live on that, however, you cannot mix them and give them the same treatment. You have to know when you build a company, a family, a society, anything you build, you have to know the place of every person. If the person does, is not in that level of purification, so you have to lead him on the way that leads him to that place, which means you have to put him in a surrounding environment that will push him, knowing, as you know, you know, let's go to another thing. One of the most important jobs in every profession is analyzing the situation and finding what's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't know it's broken, you cannot fix it. If you go around and say, everything is perfect, yeah? 10, 9, 8, 7, you know, 1, 0, boom. You could just go around and say, everybody's perfect, everybody's great. If you don't know what's wrong, you can fix it. One of the major things in today's education is to find the child, to take the child and to find out what's good. You know, every child is supposed to be a mathematician. No. No. God forbid. <laughs> Who's going to do art? Who's going to play the music? You can't have everyone. We are not built for the same thing. So to know, and the school system is starting to go that way, that some kids are not supposed to study too much mathem mathematics. And some kids are supposed to, to learn mathematics. Some kids are very good at music. If we are not going to develop that skill, we are all going to lose it. We, dif we are different. Same thing with our levels of authenticity and development through the reincarnations. So someone who's more, you know, my son, he was going to a school when he was in a teenager in high school and he came home every day and he said, I can't, I can't go to that school anymore. I can't. I said, why? It's like, you know, all the kids, they don't care about the rules. They don't care about morals. They spend the whole day rebelling against the teachers. I can't study. So I said, but that's the way school system is today. He says, no, there must be a school I can go. There was a fight. Finally, he forced us to look for schools. There were 120 schools that were potentially good for him. We found one of them that he wanted, the toughest of them all. So I said to him, like, that's going to be so tough for you. I said, I have to go there. So he moved to another city. He moved to that school. And he comes home and he says, Dad, this is home. I said, what happened? He said, we went into, we had a uh, math quiz. The teacher put the, the, uh, the uh, quiz on everybody's tables on the, in the class. He went out of the class. Everybody did the quiz. Nobody looked outside their paper. So said, what a relief. <laughs> what a relief. Everybody could be trusted. Of course, that a group like this can take a mission and get things done differently than a group that each one has a competition who rebels against the law more than others. This group is chaotic. You have no idea what you can get out of this group. You have to spend so much energy to watch them. Correct? Vayakel is about building the tabernacle. 
Vayakel is about building a community. Vayakel is about building a life. When you build a life, you need to do profiling. You have to check every person you're in touch with so you know what kind of a treatment that person needs in order to get to their best. You can't treat everyone the same because some people, they are worthy to trust. And some people, if you trust them, it's called in the biblical law, Lifnei Iver Lotasim Michshol. Never put an obstacle in front of a blind person. What does it mean? If you are the boss of your department head, and you have a guy working with you, and you know this guy is an amazing worker. However, he has a weakness. When he sees nobody is watching, he can take something to the side. Never leave him alone because he will steal because he didn't watch him. And it's your fault, says the Bible. Your fault because you knew he has that weakness. Don't put him in front of a temptation he cannot withstand because it will be your fault. You can't treat them all the same way. Different people have different paths. And it's your responsibility saying, no, everybody is so nice. Everybody is so sweet. Everybody has a soul. Everybody wants just good. Okay. So why is murder rate is going up? Why is it that there's so much crime? Why is it that blah, 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 blah. Why is it that there's still so much, so much injustice in every system? <laughs> Either you're watching too much. Or you don't realize that you have to treat people the way they need to be treated. So let's start with ourselves. Instead of now, we're not going to change the world right now. Uh, of course, consciousness has a lot of power. But each one of us. Vayakel means making a community. Says Rav Ashlag, you want to grow, you need a community. You cannot grow by yourself. Why? You cannot lift yourself like this to a higher level. No one can. No one can. All great Kabbalists know that they cannot do it on their own. All of them. Therefore, they know they have, they must join forces with other people of their kind. And that means Vayakel Moshe Koradat Neisrael Moses gathered all the Israelites who went through the refinement in Egypt. And he separated the Erev from them. You guys need to go through another road because you need a different way of education. Okay? You have to take the education and fit it for the needs of the child. Right? The same thing. You need to fit the environment to the person, to his qualification and his abilities. So you're not going to put an obstacle in front of a blind person. And you have to be aware of it. If the moment you say, no, everybody is lying, you're supposed to trust everyone. That's why the next parasha, Pekudei, what's the first thing about Pekudei? Everything has to be transparent. Moses is teaching us. I'm Moses. And I'm showing you guys, you know, I'm the man of God. I'm the chosen one that God spoke with me twice, 40 days, no food, no drink, for 40 days, twice. And you know what? I took all the money for building the tabernacle, and I'm telling you what I did with every penny. Why? To set an example. No one is above the law. No, no one is above criticism. No one is above checks and balances. No one. The moment everything is exposed and everybody can see, it can work. Don't trust me, says Moses, and don't trust anyone else. There's only one God, and it's not a human being. We'll never be. And human beings, what do they do? We learned last week, they fall. So, you don't want to put an obstacle in front of a blind person. So what do you do? Transparency. 
checks and balances. Everybody is watching everybody else. The moment this is not in existence, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. So, therefore, if you want to raise yourself to a higher level, says the Zohar, which is a very important thing, even Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai never said that he published the Zohar because he was such a great righteous person. He didn't say that. He says the secrets of the Zohar have been published because of the love of the friends of his community. There were 10 sages in the Idra Rabbah. When Rabbi Shimon comes out of the cave in Pekin, where he spoke with Elijah the prophet and with Moses, he comes out of that cave and he, he gets his real good friends. There were 10 of them all together. They go to another cave, the Idra Rabbah, the big assembly, and they reveal the biggest secrets of the Zohar, almost the biggest. And Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon says, it is, why is it like this? It is because the love we have for each other. Because we kiss each other, we hug each other, we care for each other, we trust each other. And therefore, all of those secrets came to the world because of the love we have for each other. He never said because we are smart. He never said because we are, we are talented. He said because we love each other. That community generated a light that moved the whole planet a big step forward. So, you go later on, all the Kabbalists of Tzfat, they had groups, they never trusted themselves. You go to, uh, to the uh, Rabbi Yosef Kao, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, who was a great Kabbalist himself. All of them had groups. Rabbi Azakloria had a bunch of students. All of them were organized in groups in which we, they were supporting each other, loving each other, caring for each other. You want to grow spiritually, says Rabbi Ashlag? The Zohar is an amazing, powerful tool. The letters of the Zohar, the reading, the scanning, the energy of the Zohar will bring you to highest levels. That's not enough. You need people around you for checks and balances. Don't we know people that study Zohar and go to kinds of places like, how did you get there? You're not supposed to get there when you study the Zohar. You're not supposed to come to a place of pain and misery and despair. And Why, why people go there? Says Rav Ashlag. It's all about the group that you create, all the community that you create. Which means... If you really want to commit, says Rav Ashlag, you want to commit to a spiritual group, a spiritual grow, you have to commit to a spiritual group. How do you do that? You create a group. That's why it says, Make yourself a teacher and buy yourself a friend. Buy. If you think it's going to be for free, no. How do you do that? How does it start? Chapter 35, verse 1. And he says to them, These are the things that God ordered to do. Verse 2, chapter 35. Six days, work will be done. On the seventh day, it will be holy. Shabbat, Shabbaton, to the Creator. Whoever will be doing work on that day will be killed, will be dead. Did we study about Shabbat last week and the weeks before? Isn't that redundant? Didn't we hear that there's not even an iota in the Torah that is not meant to be there? You want to start a community? How? Shabbat. Get yourself, buy yourself a friend. Make sure you always have someone invited for Shabbat dinner. Oh, but you have to cook, you have, yeah, you have dishes. Buy yourself a friend, it won't be for free. 
the ones who invest in it will finally get a community. That's how you get to know the people. That's how you start creating a community till you get those people that you can meet on Shabbat and call them a community and you can feel, you can trust them and they can trust you and when they see you falling, they say, hey, you're falling. We want to help you. You're doing this, you're not, you're not supposed to, we love you and you love us and we know we, you can listen to us. Without that kind of a surrounding, without that kind of a support, says Rav Ashlag, how can you have enough energy to lift yourself above your desire to receive for the self alone and to a higher place? You need to have that commitment. Start with the Shabbat dinner. Start with the Shabbat group. That's why it says starting with that. After you do that, you will start to reveal the most amazing secrets that the universe has. Most of them are hidden in the secrets of Shabbat. So praying together, that's all the secrets, the most important secrets of the whole Zohar, of how praying is a tool to lift yourself from one level to another. Why is it that praying by yourself is never like praying with other people? Why do you need to have a minion? Says the Zohar, yet if you pray just by yourself, what did we say? Every person is different. One person is more chesed, another one is more gevura, another one is more tiferet, hod, netza, whatever. Ten men, statistically, have enough frequencies to create a hole. One is missing, you don't have a hole, you can't climb high enough. You know what? How many social skills you need in order to have ten men for the prayers? It forces you to do that. Not by mistake. More than that, you have the biggest secrets of Shabbat. How the magic of Shabbat, the reading of the Torah of Shabbat, is so essential for the person to lift himself up above all the illusions of physicality. It's all here in this parasha. You start with Shabbat. After you have a group of Shabbat, then you start supporting each other during the weekdays because you trust each other. And today it's not so hard. You have WhatsApp. You have all kinds of uh, you have phones. You don't have to see the person because people are running like crazy. And you know what? It's very good if you see the person and you study with that person and you work, learn with that person and you do stuff with that person and you consult that person and you can really feel safe to tell the truth and hear the truth. And that is the basics in a world that is, some go with the golden calf, some go with hatred, some go with materialism, and you look at them and say, how could they be so blind? Standing on Mount, Mount Sinai, you've seen what happened to Egypt and you do the golden calf. Can we understand that? No. How many times we see other people doing mistakes like unheard of? Can we understand it? No. How many times we do mistakes and other people can... How did you do that? How did you... How dare you doing that? We need a system that will get us out of our bondage. Now, after the gone calf, you go this way, you go this way. You want to go that way, you have to create a community. Otherwise, when you're alone, you are prey. The dark side, poof, um, eats you up, no remnants. It's over with. And you see people around fall into all kinds of nonsense, destroying their families, destroying their business. Why? Because they were so much into the golden calf, into their own desire to receive for the self alone. Why? Why golden calf? The calf is from the ox. What is the ox, basically? Left column. What's gold? Left column. Red. Golden calf means me, me, and again me. 
desire to receive for the self alone. When you worship that, you can have so many titles from universities, so what? If you don't have friends around you who say, hey, wake up, what are you doing? And then you see people with power who abuse that power. Sexually, money-wise, trust, power. People get power hungry. If you don't have a community to support you, to tell you, wake up, what are you doing? You're lost. Make yourself a community. No excuses. Start with Shabbat. Thank you.